Dette er nyheter som NRK og TV2 ikke vil at sauen i Norge skal ha. De skal være, i Norge er det manipulasjon og nyheter. Men dette er det snakket om i hele verden, den hundreårsbehivenhet som hadde på å skje. At dollaren har falt, men det er folk som ikke vil forrekte det. Husk at Norge har mye av pengene sine i amerikanske børser og knyttet opp i dette amerikanske systemet. Så dette vil være veldig ille for noe. Og de som ikke sitter, de som kun må ha alle nyheter på TV2, eller på NRK, eller på VG, eller whatever, som ikke tror dere fører, dere har dere selv å takke for det dere nå taper. The dollar is facing a revolt. The world knows it as the king of currencies, but the dominance of the dollar is now under threat. More and more countries are looking for alternatives, and China's yuan is emerging as a clear challenger. Beijing is pursuing a string of deals. The latest one is with Brazil. Brazil and China are ditching the dollar. From now on, they'll use their own currencies for trade. So China is pushing the yuan. What about the Indian rupee? It's not far behind. The Indian rupee is also emerging as a serious contender. And why are these trends significant? Because currencies drive commerce. The dollar's dominance gives the US an outsized influence on the global economy, and a shift away from the dollar will only hurt America. It will also hasten the rebalancing of the global economy. In the next few minutes, we'll look at this trend and where this is going. First, the events in Brazil. Brazil announced the deal yesterday, and it did not come out of the blue. The agreement had been in the works for a while. A preliminary pact was signed in the month of January. It laid the foundations of the final agreement. And it's a fairly simple deal. Earlier, Brazil and China used the US dollar for trade. Now they will deal in their native currencies. China will use the yuan, and Brazil will use the Brazilian reais. How does it help? It will save costs. Look at the official statement from Brazil. This is what it says. The expectation is that this will reduce costs, promote even greater bilateral trade, and facilitate investment. China is Brazil's biggest trading partner. Last year, their bilateral trade was worth over $150 billion. So it makes sense for Brazil to ditch the dollar. But what's in it for China? Beijing is on a mission. It wants to internationalize the yuan. It is building a large coalition of partners. These are countries that will use the yuan instead of the US dollar, and Beijing has made considerable progress in this direction. It has secured bilateral pacts with 41 countries so far. The total value of these agreements is more than $500 billion. So the yuan is gaining international acceptance. And the petro yuan is rising. Now, what is the petro yuan? It's not a different currency. Petro yuan is simply using the yuan to settle oil bills, just like the petro dollar. And China is making an aggressive push for this. It is finding takers in oil-producing nations. Russia, for instance, it has embraced the yuan. So have Iran, Venezuela, and some African nations. Now, reports say Saudi Arabia is also considering the switch, the switch from the dollar to the yuan. And this is going to be a very important development. We know that Riyadh has been at odds with Washington and is getting closer to Beijing. But ditching the dollar will be a decisive move. Meanwhile, the Indian rupee is also competing in this race. Last year, India's Reserve Bank made a move. It allowed international trade settlements in the Indian rupee. It's still early days, but India has made progress. Banks in 18 countries have shown interest. They've opened special accounts, and these accounts will help them settle trade payments in the Indian rupee. And these are the countries we're talking about. They're ditching the dollar. They want to use the Indian rupee for trade with India. Earlier this year, Brazil and Argentina floated an idea. They're thinking about a common currency for South America. Halfway across the world, Southeast Asia, too, is losing patience with the US dollar. In Africa, countries like Kenya are dumping the dollar. They'll use the Kenyan shilling for oil imports. So here's a question. Why is all of this happening now? Why is there a global rebellion against the dollar? Also, how did the dollar become the world's reserve currency? It happened after the Second World War, in the year 1944. 44 allied countries met at Bretton Woods in the US. 44 countries came together. They wanted to avoid another financial turmoil, so they created a system, a set of rules that would shape the global economy as we know it today. It led to the creation of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, also the World Bank. 
The allies also agreed to a new exchange rate system. Each country pegged the value of its currency to the US dollar, and that's how the American dollar gained its dominance. The Bretton Woods Conference gave the US immense power to dominate the global economy. It created two financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, largely controlled by America. And they're still quite powerful and still led by the US. As for the dollar, it is still widely used, both inside and outside the US. About $1 trillion notes are in circulation outside America. Some 40% of the world's debt is issued in US dollars. Nearly 60% of the global currency reserves are in US dollars, and close to 90% of all foreign exchange trade involves the US dollar. The world economy is hooked to the dollar, but now it wants to give up this addiction, but it will not happen overnight. The dollar's downfall, though, has begun. Og den som ikke forstår dette, det er jo han som har problem. Og det er blant annet norske politikere, norske økonomer, de fornekter virkeligheten. Og folk i Norge som kunne vandre med å se på norsk media, propagandamedia nummer en i verden, så er Norge, og det er jo mye propagandamedia i verden likevel også. Men dette er globalisterne som har tapt. Agenda 2030 og dette her bærekraftsmålet som er religionen som holder på med her i Norge, den vil ikke resten av verden være med på. Så enten kan en fornekte dette, og da vil han bare ta bare mer og mer, eller så må en gjøre noen grebler. Det jeg har prøvd å vekke her, for dette har jeg sitt lenge kom, og var veldig aktiv, men folk forstår det jo ikke. De fornekte det. Stikk og hov i saen, og tror at dette skal gå over av seg selv. Så enkelt er det. Men nå er det bekreftet, nå er det 1. april, dette her er jo for to dager siden, og og jeg sitter her. Jeg visste det kom til å skje noe i april, men folk liksom ikke hører nyhet med NRK eller TV2, da skal det fornektes. For jeg forstår ikke det at det går til å rulle ut av den norske staten. Den norske staten kan gjøre akkurat som vil med dere, for dere gjerne er døde. Så ikke forstår det at dere blir rulle ut. Norge bruker 10,2 milliarder i året på å lure dere. Tensions. Og undertaken innovativ strategi til ensure that we ease the burden of availability of dollar in our market. We just concluded last week an arrangement, a market-driven arrangement in our fuel sector that will see Kenya access all our fuel uh, needs on a deferred six-month credit. That will, that will eliminate a demand of $500 million every month from this market. And therefore, uh, for the people who work numbers, I am giving you free advice that those of you who are holding dollars, you surely might go into losses. They took the world off the gold standard in 1971. We have seen a very high frequency of hyperinflationary episodes where fiat currencies around the world have failed. This is because when a currency does not have anything restraining its creation other than political will, and usually the political will is to create more of it. And when that happens, the end result is a hyperinflationary collapse, and we've seen a lot of that happening over the last few decades. If you take a look at this chart from at Bitcoin Homer, you can see a list of 152 currencies that have collapsed due to hyperinflation. The average lifespan of these is about 25 years and the median lifespan is seven years. But it's not just the small countries, the emerging markets, the dictators in control of small countries, it's even the big boys. And while some of these currencies listed have not yet fallen, we can see that most of the major currencies over the last 120 years have lost almost all or all of their value since inception. This infographic from Visual Capitalist shows some of the current major currencies and how much value they have lost versus gold over the last couple of decades. So we understand throughout history that hundreds of fiat currencies 
have hyperinflated away, have collapsed due to overprinting, and that it's not just the small countries, the corrupt countries. It's major countries that are have either gone through that or are headed that direction right now. But it's not even just the major countries. We also see this pattern happening with the countries that control the global reserve currency. This visualization by Ray Dalio shows the rise and fall, relatively speaking, of great empires throughout the last 500 years. And breaking down the factors that lead to the rising and the falling of these empires, we see the black line that shows the reserve currency status is actually one of the last things to fail. And this brings us to the dollar. In 2020 dollars, if you go back to the inception of the dollar, which in this case is actually the Federal Reserve note in 1913, it was worth $26.14. Over time, you can see that it has lost almost all of that value. The reason this happens is because of the nature of what currencies actually are. A currency always starts off as a redeemable instrument for a scarce asset. Normally throughout history, that has been gold. People put their gold in the banks, in the vaults, in the central bank, and they receive a piece of paper that says they can go get that money, that gold back at any time. But eventually what happens is the central government, normally in conjunction with the central bank, is too hungry for more purchasing power. And instead of only issuing the same number of notes, currency units, redemption requests, claims on that gold as the gold that they actually have, they end up doing it just a little bit too much and printing a little bit too many because they think, hey, what's a little extra purchasing power gonna hurt? Well, eventually it hurts. There's a run on the bank. People go to get their gold and it's not there. That's exactly. Her kommer jo gråtigheten til det norske folket og norske politikerne. Han forteller om hvor galt dette i Amerika, dette her, og Norge er enda verre. Den norske eller amerikanske dollaren har steget med 85 prosent. Og det ser vi med euroen også, der er det en godt 30 prosent. Og danske kroner ser vi jo i 100 over 150 kroner for å, for å få 100 danske. Så Norge er jo et av verste englander her også. Men folk er så steindomme her i Norge, de forstår ikke dette her, fordi har noen sånne løgneforklaringer at de selger norske kroner, og det er det andre med oljegreiene. Rundlurt da. For det, hvis det var tilfellet, så ville de bare funnet en annen måte å gjøre det på. Så Norge er steindomme, så, så ikke har hun klart å funne en løsning på det der gang, hvis det er en teorien der. Men det er ikke det. Det, det er bedrageri Norge heller på med. For å lure av dere. Og så kan du betale enda mer skatt, enda mer eiendomsavgift, og you name it i dette landet. For, for no, folk, skal, folk skal ikke ha penger i Norge. Staten skal. Staten skal bygges. Men det skal en stor stat offentlig administrasjon med. Og politikere som kan springe rundt og er der kissebær med de store. Det er det Norge har. Folk som har alvorlige personforstørrelser. Så aldri får nok. Det er det vi har i Norge. For vi har hatt et skolesystem som har favorisert folk som kan memorere. Folk som kan høre, kan, kan, kan lære, sitter og printer inn i hodet på folk. Det er det vanne sine. Ranglære er det jeg har opplært det. Og så er det de som er flinke til å, å være på skolen og memorere det denne gallen læreren har, har printet inn og programmert i de ungene. Så får de høye stillinger, gode karakterer, så igjen gir høye stillinger i offentlig sektor og, og rundt familietarstillinger. Og så er det folk som ikke gir på skolen, som er kreative, kan tenke jeg selv, de, de, i mindre tall, de er jo ikke på skolen, de har ikke titel, de. Så det, det er galskap satt i systemet i dette landet her. Den norske modellen har havererert alldeles til å ha, ha Gro Harland Brundtland. Hun begynte med den her uh, Brundtland-kommisjonen på 80-tallet, med det grønne skiftet og miljø og bla bla, og dette og sorte religioner i Norge. Så bruker vi hele oljeformuen og alt det der greiene på å skredde av verden, mens ingen andre holder på med dette her andre, religionen. Så egentlig det som skjer nå, så er det gå en til passord til norske folk som er så likegyldige. Faktisk. For det, det virker som det går ikke an å snakke det, for de må lære det på den harde måten, så med andre som har våknet forstand av dette. Jeg har lært å skjønne den harde måten fra 2009, jeg har vært angrepet en av Norges rikest og en gjøn og korrupt kommune jeg bytte i tidligere. Og et politi som er like korrupt. Jeg vet hva dette går i. Jeg har vært gjøn av det selv i ni år nå. 
Så det forklarer jeg ikke det her, hvordan systemet fungerer. Its biggest fight of its life right now. The U.S. dollar is in real trouble. I'm going to tell you what happened this week, which I think is an absolute game changer for U.S. monetary policy and, frankly, global power structure. You know, we've been talking about the new world order, what that's going to look like. The United States and the globalists that run the World Economic Forum want a, what they call a unipolar order, right? One sort of globalist cabal that's running the show. Well, there are other countries that have a different opinion of that and do not believe that we should have a unipolar order. They want a multipolar order, that every country, territory, land, customs, cultures are all different. You're really going to run what happens in Russia and Canada and Brazil with one government run out of Brussels, right? It doesn't make any sense, but that's what the globalists want. They also want a one world sort of digital currency that they control everything. Again, other countries have a different opinion of that and they don't think that globalists should be running the show. And you're seeing the US dollar in the middle of all of this being crushed as a result. So what happened this week? Well, a couple of big moving pieces. First of all, Moscow was probably the biggest story in the world, but of course the mainstream media in the United States wants you to focus on other stories. They want you to focus on you know, Donald Trump being arrested or whatever reality TV show issue is going on right now or the Academy Awards or whatever. No, no, the biggest story in the world happened in Moscow this week. Chinese President Xi Jinping flew into Moscow, met with Vladimir Putin. They met for three days and they wrote up and documented 14 different signed agreements. 14 of them. They met for hours every day. And when they left, they said, we are about to change the world order, shook hands and said, goodbye, my friend. It was a, an unbelievable summit if you're paying attention to what's happening in the world right now. Now, remember about a year ago when President Biden flew into Saudi Arabia and was basically mocked. And when they left, they, it was well reported that they were laughing at him when he left. He was begging them to not cut production of oil and you know, create new oil partnerships with the United States. They basically looked right in his face and said, no, we're not going to do that. So what happened this week? Well, these 14 agreements that Vladimir Putin signed with Xi Jinping are about trade, uh, the, the economy, um, currency, um, about military exercises. The list is pretty much endless. Um, new rail infrastructure, trade routes, etc. But to me, the biggest story was about settling uh, oil transactions and making trade transactions settled with the Chinese currency, the yuan, okay, instead of U.S. dollars. The same thing happened in Saudi Arabia this week. Saudi Arabia discussing, discussing with China, Saudi Arabia talking with China about tr settling their oil transactions with the Chinese currency yuan. Okay, so that might not sound like much to the layperson, but when the petrodollar, the US dollar, which is how all oil transactions are settled, now will be upended and removed, and oil will now be settled with the Chinese yuan, that is a game changer. Arguably the biggest story we've seen in decades. The fact that oil has always been traded in dollars. If that were to end, that would mean the end of the U.S. dollar. Why is that? The U.S. uses the dollar as a cudgel. It uses it as an axe. It uses it to uh, put sanctions on other countries. Oh, we, don't, we want you to do this. We want you to act a certain way. So we will use the U.S. dollar to sanction you. You want oil? Well, it's because it's the petrodollar. You want to settle your oil transactions? You have to do it in the U.S. dollar. You better listen to us with our sanctions. The world's second largest economy and its largest energy exporter are together actively trying to dent the dollar's dominance as the anchor of the international financial system. Will they succeed? The dollar is America's last surviving superpower. It gives Washington unrivaled economic and political muscle. It can slap sanctions on countries unilaterally, which frees that country out of large parts of the world economy. And Washington can spend freely, certain that its debt will be bought up by the rest of the world. That's what we do. Now imagine if we remove the US dollar from, the, from oil transactions. Well, what happens? The US cudgel of sanctions starts to move away starts to dissolve and U.S. power is dissolving. And that's why you're seeing this week over the past 48 hours, the United States ramping up wanting to increase their military budget by 40% to attack China.
These are the words literally from our defense secretary that we're adding 40% to our defense budget for readying for war with China. This is why it all comes down to the US dollar. It's about nothing else. It's not about Chinese soldiers showing up in your backyard and trying to steal your, you know, steal your pool toys. No, it's about, it's about the economy. It's about the power of the US dollar versus the Chinese yuan. And it's about a new global power alliance. So folks, pay attention to what's happening here. In fact, we had our, our, one of our team members, our bookkeeper even reached out to us this morning and said, my husband and I are very concerned about what's about to happen. If, if Saudi Arabia switches from the US dollar to the Chinese yuan, what does that mean for the US dollar? We've been warning you here on the show, what's happening to the US dollar? All you need to do is look at what Jerome Powell just announced this week, right? Which is a rate increase. Okay, a small rate increase, but then Fed watchers are seeing that we're going to see rate cuts in June and December. That means they are saying, they're throwing their hands up saying, we don't know what to do anymore. We're basically, we're done. We're gonna let the market sort itself out. What that means is that investors are leaving the US dollar. They're going to go to internationally to something more that are gonna yield higher results instead of US treasuries and bonds. We're gonna get out of the US dollar. We're gonna go into other territories. So you're seeing now the decline, the buying power of the U.S. dollar plummeting. Is your retirement tied to the U.S. dollar? This is all you need to be asking yourselves. Like when you're sitting around the dinner table with your husband or wife, say to yourself, you know, is my, is my retirement account tied to the U.S. dollar? What that means is that these companies, these stocks, these stock market companies that you're invested in, right, Ford, et cetera, are their profits going to go down because the U.S. buying power is declining? They're, therefore, uh, people are, are going to have less money in the United States. We are heading into a recession. That means these corporate profits that you're relying on for your stock values of your 401k to go up arguably are going to go down, right, in my opinion. I mean, you can just look at, you can look at what's happening, right? If these companies are laying off thousands of people and people aren't buying their stuff, how are their profits going to go up and their stock goes up and your retirement account goes up? The answer is it's not. So where are you going to put your money? You know, again, I talk about real estate on this channel. You know, we, if you want to book a call with our team, again, real estate, we're only building about 500 homes this year. So it's not like we have like millions we can help people with. But if you're a, someone who is interested in investing in real estate, you know, you can book a call. Det man også ser, det er jo helt utroligt at uh, journalister, redaktører i Norge ikke har informert det norske folk om dette. Det viser hvor blod korrupt media er i Norge, med høye lønninger, og staten bruker 10,2 milliarder på dem. For de skal, politi- nei, redaktørene eller media skal jo være den fjerde statsmakter, men det er kjøpt i. Landsvikerne, journalistene og redaktørene, de må jo være, eller hadde han her, han er landsviker med de i, i Norge under krigen. Må jo være de. De påfører mye mer herråden på folk og økonomiske utfordringer nå. Så jeg er bare redd at uh, i oppgjør etter dette her, så det begynner man å både journalister og redaktører begynner å se seg over nakken og gi ut og løve og skuldrene. At det ikke folk teker til høygafler og kommer etter dem. For det er de som har gjort at folk har stolt på, på politikerne. På grunn av media har sviktet sin jobb og se på, fylle med makthaverne. Det er jo media som begynner å gå etter befolkningen. De har snudd seg av deg. Og jeg vet ikke om i Norge hvordan uh, lønne er i folk er, men jeg tror ikke det blir bare, bare, bare å være redaktør fremover. Når folk virkelig får føle og se, jeg vet ikke hvor fort dette går, om, det, om folk våkner fort, eller folk ikke våkner fort, eller ikke bryr seg, det vet jeg ikke. Det er jo noe med denne herrene vaksinen i denne siden, at det er ikke så mye sirkulasjon i de grå, små grå lenger. Så det vet jeg, men jeg ser i hvert fall galskapen, og mange ser galskapen. Og da er jeg redd at det, er, det kan være det hett å være redaktør. For det er de som er ansvarlig, de har sviktet jobben sin. Korrupte politikere, egoister og gjerne døve politikere, det er en ting. Men de som, egentlig, som folk er stolt på, og, og da i media, så... så var med å førte 90 prosent av det norske folket til galken med disse spreitene. Det var akkurat det samme, og mediepropaganda de holdt på med. Folk fikk ikke, folk fikk ikke rette informasjon da heller. Du fikk ikke 
Du fick bara skrämsel frukt propaganda från media och så att de så fråråda vaccinen då jag kommer inte till i media. Och så är det ekonomiska systemet och det har också har media valt och 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 vara politen och lura folk att den norska folket ska ta bara pengar och sina nå. Och det ser man också väldigt lätt på de hauser att det här bitcoin och krypto och allt det där grejerna för det var nog de fant på i, i 2008-2009 under finanskrisen så att det inte folk skulle gå bananas på guld och sölj för det har på sig i 2009 och så fant de på den och lurt folk att krypto och grejen och bla bla och allt det där grejerna men det, detta, det kan jag inte detaljer nok om men det, det är kjema folk går till lurte in i det för det skriver media lite om och skryter av och ja for makt har vandret, jeg har hatt makt og alltid, men nå har de minst av det takket være Putin og, og Kina, så, så fikk torpedere dette her globalist agenda 2030, så Norge har vært å pådrive for. Og nå ryker Amerika, nå ryker Norge, og nå ryker Europa. Og så er det bare da, da får vi, jeg tippet det landet som kommer til å hoppe ut over dette her greiene, tror jeg er Tyskland, for jeg har alltid sett på Tyskland som et de mest oppegående folk her i, i Europa. Jeg tror tyskerne er de som kommer til å forlade nei, EU først og nå når de ser og begynner å gå opp for folk hvordan de har gjort og lurt det. For de har ikke sjans når de møter Brikslandene og dette her greiene. Da er det de som overtegger lederansvaret. Og da er det, kan jeg sitte der og, 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 og tro at jeg kommer på høyen selv hvor lenge jeg vil, men du, du klarer aldri få tilbake makt. Amerikanske tollene er død. Og det, enten hvordan dette blir tog ned, hvor fort det blir tog ned, det vet vi ikke, men det går i hvert fall den veien. Det vet vi. The bond assets falls. Is that the simplest explanation for what happened in terms of the banking crisis here in the U.S.? And were, this, were these just idiosyncratic problems with bank managers that didn't know what they were doing? Idioterne har vært en seier. Yes, it's a good part of it. Uh, both bank managers, uh, regulators and investors forgot about uh, duration risk and market risk. When yields are higher, the price of the bonds is lower. Investor lost 20% last year on 10-year treasuries. The S&P 500 went down only by 15%. And for the overall US banks, you have about $620 billion of unrealized losses on the securities out of a capital of 2.2 trillion. And for some of the regional banks, the number are much higher. But it's not just the securities have lower value. Many of the banks had issued loans, like mortgages at fixed rates at 30% 30 years, when interest rates were 1%, while right now there are three and a half for 10 year treasury. So the market value of those assets is also down. People have estimated, therefore, the overall losses for the US banking system for the rise in interest rates, both on securities and loans, are equivalent to 1.8 trillion out of a capital of 2.2 trillion. Hundreds of the smaller banks are literally insolvent. So that's the fundamental problem. When interest rates go higher, the value of securities and loans is lower, and then we have mass liquidity and solvency problems. Y your recent book was called Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends that Imperil Our Future, and I wonder if this is among them. Uh, you know, interest rates at 5% or even 6% don't seem like a mega threat. We've had rates as high as 20% in, in recent history in the, in the early 80s, but we have so much more debt now than we did back then, which means carrying <laughs> costs are much more painful. Is this uh, higher rate regime a mega threat, Nuriel? It is because uh, in the 1970s, when we had the stagflationary shock, that led to inflation and recession. Debt ratios in advanced economies were only 100% of GDP, private and public debt. Today, there are 420. So we have the worst of the 70s in terms of negative supply shock, reduced growth and cause inflation. And we have debt ratios that are much higher than after the GFC crisis. And during the GFC crisis, we had the debt problem, housing debt, mortgages, bank debt, but we had negative demand shocks and a credit crunch that led to deflation so we could do massive monetary, fiscal and credit easing. Now we're entering a recession and financial instability, having to raise interest rates because the inflation is too high. So we get 
inconsistency in a trilemma. We cannot achieve price stability, maintain economic growth, have financial stability at the same time. So eventually we'll have an economic and financial crash. Mm. I mean, central banks say they can do those two things. Good morning to you, Nuriel. They say that they can have financial stability and they can uh, control monetary policy because they're different levers do dealing with different problems. You doubt that? Yeah, there's this separation principle that says we're going to use the interest rate policy for price stability and we're going to use liquidity to backstop the financial system and have financial stability. But that occurs only when the problems of the financial system are purely liquidity and limited to individual institutions. When you have a systemic problem and there is a risk of insolvency, and by the way, an economic recession is going to lead us from duration and market risk to credit risk, you cannot essentially lose uh, liquidity support of the banks as a way of backstopping the system and there's an inconsistency between price stability and financial stability and we're headed towards a hard landing a credit crunch and significant amounts of losses both for debtors that are facing much higher nominal and real rates but also for savers and creditors because rising interest rates reduces the market value of their creditors assets so you have financial instability yeah. price instability and economic instability Nuriel, you used the phrase credit crunch and we all threw around the term credit crisis in the late 2000s. We know that that led to the uh, financial crisis and everything that followed. How bad do you think this credit crunch gets this time around? We heard the Fed uh, uncertain uh, and, and many voices uncertain about how much we see a pullback in the offering of credit. Well, most of the financing to SMEs and to households in the U.S. occurs not from the large uh, money center banks, but from these regional banks. And these regional banks are in trouble. There is deposit flight, there are insured deposits, there are fundamental security losses. There will be a tightening of credit and credit standards. They have to be more cautious, they have to raise capital. So they're going to lend more. Credit growth is going to probably go from 10% annualized to closer to zero and therefore a good chunk of Main Street in Middle America is going to be subject to a significant credit crunch that's going to exacerbate the risk of a harder landing of the real economy. Do we have, I, I want to change subjects a bit, Nouriel, and talk about another threat that Steve Ratner has raised in a New York Times op-ed. He thinks working from home is a real problem for America, for American productivity, especially as uh, Europeans and, and, other, uh, uh, and other cultures return to the office. Do you believe that it's going to be an issue if we don't get back five days a week? Is that going to be a problem for productivity? Well, there are different views on it. Some people believe that uh, the optimal situation like now, having two or three days at home, two or three days at work, is okay, depends on the type of professions. But I think the biggest issue with the labor market right now is that we have unemployment rate very low, we have aging of population, we have the falling labor force participation rate, we have restriction to migration, we have beginning of uh, labor strife and strikes and so on. We have the great resignation, so we have wage inflation around uh, 6% and people don't want to go back to work because the labor market is tight and they have uh, now power. That means that inflation is not going to fall towards 2% because in the service sector, the main cost of production is labor cost. And if wage inflation stays around 5 6% with the tightness of the labor market and the power that people have to stay at home, then inflation is not going to fall. And therefore, the Fed will have to hike rates much more than 5%. And if they don't do it because they worry about an economic and financial crash, there will be eventually a de-anchoring of inflation expectation, a wage price spiral, and we're going to end up with high inflation, recession, and the kind of stagflation like we saw in the 1970s. This seems to. Nu detta jag har sagt i den här tid att de kan välja med pest och kolera. De kommer ju ta det här av. Och Norge är ju ett av de värsta. Men jag har ett oljefond, ja, men det är inte mycket värde i det som också kolera länge. Och så här med Norge har världens befolkningen ser mest för gälla. Så detta, detta går ju gott för några. De som tror att detta är något som är det här arna. Jag har inte förstått allvar. Så enkelt är det bara. För om du har ett oljefond 
så er baserat på dollar och och ax upplöst aktier i ett fiatsystema. Och så har du en befolkning så har enorma gäll upp i dörrarna på boligarna sina. Så kan inte detta gå bort. För de har gäll på 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 allvarde i sig boliga. Och så hemma byggde så hemma formuen på på aktier och sånne ting så är fiat pengar och detta rasa så vill ju det sagt folk när 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 oljefonden rasar i värde i förhållande till guld och sølv så vill ju och värdena på boligar i Norge rasa. Det så och gäller så då blir gäller mindre värd. Och då rasar priserna på alla egendomar på grund av så många egendomar som går ifrån egendomarna kommer dig på salg på salg så vill ju de egendomarna där och ta med sig värdien på de egendomarna så inte för salg men men det var så enormt med boliga för salg att det får ett boligkollaps på båda. Och och det betyder ju något för dig folk och så inte ska sälja om, om du bor i en bolig och så det är vad på 5 miljoner kronor om den halverar sig i pris eller 70 och 80 ner i pris betyder ju hur du bor av bara. Men de stackarna så så har köpt boliga och och här är det 70 80 90 procent hjälp på dig. De tar på allt. De säger att de har har på tal halva boligen. Ta bort hela egen kapital sen i detta systemet här nu. Tackat vara politikerna, säkra ekonomisk kompetens och tackat vara ekonomer som går på någon skola och någon ofta upplevt i vrangelära. Det är det det handlar om. Jag vet men folk förstår inte allvar. Så det är de unga så tappar på detta. De som har gått in i boligmarknaden när de sista 5-10 år så ska in i marknaden att de är det visst men de som har gått in i marknaden nu de är rånlurta. De kan bli gällslava på grund av detta. Tackat vara några 60-70 åringar, 50 åringar som styrt egoister så kunde jag tänka på sig själv så i tredje i generationen så kan mitt det sig. För jag är så fokuserad på skön och karate så höga lönningar. Det ser man ju när i banker runt förbi att det är miljonlöningar eller det. Att det vet vi det att det kan ta miljonlöningar. Men de folk och så har väl miljonlöningarna. Det är egoister. De tänker kun på sig själv. De är så höga på sig själv att de 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 håller på att ta av. Sådana folk är det som har inflytelse i Norge. Sådana folk är det som är ansvariga för detta. Och så har vi dessa redaktörerna i norsk massmedia. NRK och TV2 så håller på att heja på dessa här folk med allvarlig personförstörelse och gråtighet. För att de ska tjäna så mycket. Ja. Att folk tror att alla kan tjäna 5 miljoner eller 10 miljoner eller 16 miljoner i år i lön som så, så någon har det. Men det går inte det. Och det är för att de är steinstock dumma. De är zombier som fan inte förstår en annan. De får tänka kun på sig, på sig själv. Kun på sig själv. Och sina helt närmast och de klarar sig. Så driver de alla folk på sig inte av det sånt. Det har jag upplevt så många i så många år nu. Själv. Hur folk tänker. Så, så detta blir knalltöft för många. Och de som inte har vaknat och förstått detta här nu. Ja, jag ska inte säga mer. Det blir att de får en överraskelse.